Well, about 20 years ago, uh, Beth and I moved into this neighborhood. Uh, we live in Dayton's Bluff. And we very quickly became aware that this was the most diverse neighborhood uh, in St. Paul, but it was a neighborhood that was challenged by, on the one hand, uh, economic change, and that was especially the loss of unionized blue-collar manufacturing jobs. And on the other hand, it was challenged by the very diversity that made it such a rich and interesting community, that people did not speak to each other, people did not know each other, people did not know each other's stories. Um, and about that same time, 20 years ago, uh, we connected with a couple in New York City, Jim Hatch and Camille Billups, who had a project uh, called Artist in Influence, where they interviewed artists of color about their experiences in the art world, from film to visual art to theater. Uh, and they built an archive of books and materials that supported that work. And we put all of that together and began dreaming about what it would mean to have a place here on the east side that would center the stories of immigrants and workers, uh, that would make the neighbors welcome, whether they were the third generation descendants of Swedish, Italian, German, Irish immigrants, or whether they were Somalis, Mexicans, Salvadorans, Hmong, Karen, uh, who had only arrived in the last couple of years. And we wanted people to have a place that they could come to, uh, where they could tell their stories, where people would listen to their stories, and where they would find books and resources that both affirmed the value of their experiences and their stories, and provided them with a context uh, to put those stories in. Um, and that was really how the idea of the Eastside Freedom Library took shape, really over an almost 20-year period. And then four years ago, I began planning to leave McAllister College, where I had taught immigration history and labor history and African-American history for 30 years. Um, and it came time to start looking for uh, a place to make those dreams come material, to be real to have a substance, and, and now here we are surrounded with 17,000 books cataloged by volunteers telling the stories of immigrants and workers and people of color in the United States from the origins of this nation uh, to the present. Well, uh, I think we're, we're building our reputation in the neighborhood, our relationships with people within these different communities. We have a very strong relationship with the labor movement, the St. Paul Regional Labor Federation, individual uh, union organizations from the American Postal Workers Union to the Carpenters, to the St. Paul Federation of Teachers, to SEIU Healthcare. Many different unions have come here for their own events, have come here for our events, have connected with uh, immigrant neighbors here on the east side. So. Building relationships is, is so important, and, and really one of the steps that we've taken in the last two years that has really solidified these relationships has been the organization of a union job fair, where uh, unionized employers and uh, earn while you learn apprenticeship programs uh, come to the library and, and put out their flag for what they have to offer and our immigrant neighbors, neighbors looking for jobs, looking for good unionized jobs, jobs with ladders to success, jobs with economic security, uh, jobs where workers have a voice. Uh, the union job fair became a great place where all of these connections could come together. Well, I think I'm, I've been surprised and delighted by the generosity of people. Uh, we have had probably 40 people who have been volunteers. Everything from cleaning bathrooms to building shelves to cataloging the books to mentoring kids in History Day projects. The, the generosity of those volunteers has been amazing. More than 700 individuals have donated money to the Eastside Freedom Library. Many of them as little as 10 bucks. Uh, 
but they have, have demonstrated a sense of ownership and responsibility uh, that they see this project as their project and, and not just Peter and Beth's. Um, we have had such a wide range of events from a musical concert in memory of Joe Hill to jazz concerts to a Hmong play to uh, an upcoming play called Down in Mississippi about Freedom Summer. Uh, we're going to be a host for the St. Paul Art Crawl. We're in the midst of an art exhibit of uh, pottery made by Freedom Rider Claire O'Connor um, that we're using as a way to create the opportunity for people to have in-depth conversations with each other over tea served in these beautiful teapots and cups. Um, so this range of activities uh, I never could have anticipated that so many kinds of things could happen here um, and that people would come. I, maybe the greatest example uh, is the Karen women who have come here to weave. And over two years ago, we were approached by a mental health social worker who said that there were Karen immigrant women here on the east side who felt isolated and depressed. And, and as far as she could tell, the thing they most loved in life was to weave. And did we have a space that they could use for weaving? And so we provided the beautiful downstairs space and a, a project that began with six women coming for two hours once a week has grown into a project with more than 20 women coming for six hours and, and producing enough cloth that they can actually sell some of it for income. Um, they take great pride in what they're doing. And, you know, not to beat a metaphor to death, but they, they really are weaving a community while they're weaving cloth. And it has been such an honor and a treat uh, to be able to be part of the resources that have made this, this kind of a project possible. Well, I think that one of the things that we did not uh, anticipate was the challenge of doing intergenerational work. Um, maybe a lot of our visions about storytelling we really did have kind of senior citizens in our mind's eye. And, and then we began to realize that we needed to be intentional and strategic about how we could get young people to come in here. And, and I think as everyone knows, young people today are so uh, involved with technology and it's like a, attention deficit disorder has become a center of the culture of young people. And, so the idea that sitting in an old library and looking at books uh, seems kind of, kind of countercultural to, to engage these young people. And, and so we've, we've developed a series of programs, often with the advice of young people, as to what they think will be attractive. And so we've started an open mic poetry program on the third Tuesday night of every month, uh, curated by Chia Lore of the District 1 Community Council. Um, we've done uh, mentoring of History Day projects every Saturday morning with a group of volunteer retired teachers and, uh, and kids from all over the Twin Cities coming in here. Uh, we've started a kid's story hour uh, every other Saturday with wonderful teachers uh, leading the way and beautiful children um, and sitting with, of course, Orso the library dog. Uh, as a very important part of their experience. Uh, so we're, we're creating more and more of these programs. We've, we've been working through our connections in the Karen community with Washington Technology Magnet High School and the English language learning class there. And our friend Sangmani Ratsabout, who works at the Immigration History Research Center. And, and he's taught these kids how to use the iPads that they're provided to do digital storytelling, to add music, to add text, uh, to add photographs, and, and to tell their stories, which are compelling anyway, but to tell their stories in a particularly compelling way, and, um, and to share those stories with their families and with the wider community. And so those intergenerational bridges are beginning to take shape here as well at the Eastside Freedom Line. I think the East Side Freedom Library is continuous work in progress. I mean, we certainly experience that right now. 
with the kinds of ideas that people come through the door with, which has been so gratifying, and we're able to respond, especially Peter with the amount of time that he puts in here, able to um, collaborate with new partners, neighbors, um, people who have an idea about bringing their poetry slam or their theater rehearsal or their community meeting or their important topic that needs um, you know, input of some sort. And Peter can work with them like hour by hour, really. Um, so in that sense, we've gotten to know so many people. We've been educated by the people who use the library about what a community space like this can be. So we've, um, we've lived the work in progress already. And I think that even if the library starts to announce itself in new ways that we can't imagine yet, it will always be a work in progress because a community center really needs to be that.